Yeah. I love my HBCU. Uh. And Bob? Bob? I love it, love it. Yeah. I love it, love it. Yeah. I love my HBCU. Yeah. And man. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I tune into the HCCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, she tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, yeah. he know what he be talking about. Talkin Mike about. and Charles, Talk. they know what they be talking about. Yeah. Talkin they about. compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they won a loss. Yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor uh, Yes Sir yes, and pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. Yes. And welcome in to another episode of Inside the HBCU Sports Lab. I believe we're on episode 526 of Radio HBCU uh, Radio Show and Podcast, the show that's covering the HBCU Sporting Diaspora and all things HBCU Sports, the institutions large and small from NAIA to NCAA, where we share insights. And information on the HBCU sports culture and the HBCU athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBCUs, athletic programs, and the business of HBCU sports. I'm your host, Charles Bishop, and I have my co-host tonight with me, Kelvin Carter. How you, on, Kelvin? how you doing? How you doing, Charles? Great to see you. Seems like it was just a few days ago we were in Birmingham. Exactly. We were in Birmingham just a few days ago, and of course... The mobile visiting professor, A.D. Drew, he stops in with us today. What's going on with you, A.D.? Fellas, fellas, long time no see. Great seeing everybody <laughs> once again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> can you spell it, fellas? Can uh, it, you it, spell it in the air? Hey, I told all my coaches uh, this past Tuesday, I said, you know, we got to get our tea times in because in about mm, maybe 10 days or so, I ain't going to see you guys no more. Until uh, <laughs> a celebration bowl time. So uh, we're right at the edge of it. Uh, uh, another football season upon us, 2024 season. Uh, a lot of excitement in the air. We now have had the SIC Media Day, the SWAG Media Day, CIAA Media Day, and then the MEAC Media Day is coming on next Tuesday. So uh, we'll be talking a lot of football. You know, it sort of gets the, the senses up and going, if you will. What you think, guys? Yes, indeed. Let's get the census going. No doubt about it. I'm your host, Charles Bishop, along with my host, Kelvin Carter and A.D. Drew. We're filming from our home studios and sending a signal live to our KCOH 1230 AM studios with the Texas Radio Hall of Famer, Ralph Cooper, in the beautiful home of Texas Southern University here in Houston, Texas. So, man, let's get into it, guys. A lot of stuff going on. Uh, We're, of course going to talk Swag Media Day. We were all in attendance. We'll talk a little bit about the CIAA uh, Media Day as well, uh, get the predicted order finished from there, and just get you guys' thoughts on a lot of stuff, a lot of buzz going around around uh, HBCU football. And we'll start with news and notes. Buzz here with regards to Swag Digital Network. Uh, they released their schedule uh, as they, the Swag Digital Network will be highlighting several uh, anticipated games this upcoming season. Bethune-Cookman will kick off league coverage on Saturday, uh, September 7th, when the Wildcats host Mercer. Uh, the schedule of the SWAT game includes several homecoming matchups uh, featuring Virginia Lynchburg at Texas Southern October 5th, Bethune-Cookman at Mississippi Valley on October 19th, and then you have Mississippi Valley State at Arkansas Pine Bluff October 26th, and the network will conclude its coverage on November 16th. Uh, with Bethune Cookman at Texas Southern, so a lot of great matchups. I'm gonna go go through a few of the matchups. I mentioned a few of them, uh, but you have uh, Mercy Bethune Cookman. We start there. Uh, you have Kentucky State at Alabama A&M. Uh, that will be broadcast on Swag Digital Network. Uh, Arkansas Baptist will be at UAPB. Uh, WC Gordon Classic will be broadcasted on Swag Digital Network as the Lane College Dragons they visit Jackson State. That's one of Jackson State's games on the Swag Digital Network. Then you'll have uh, Georgetown and Alabama a and Edward Waters, intriguing matchup. Edward Waters at Alcorn, Kelvin. Uh, that will be on the Swag Digital Network. You have Central Arkansas at Arkansas Pine Bluff. Uh, Al- Alcorn will be featured again. Uh, tough grudge match at Mississippi Valley State. That is September 28th. Uh, October 5th is Texas Southern's homecoming. Uh, they'll be taking on Virginia Lynchburg. Then October 12th. 
Mississippi Valley State will visit Alabama State. Uh, that's a, a October 12th matchup. Uh, October 12th as well, Southern at Texas Southern. So that'll be a great matchup. So a lot of great matchups uh, coming up on Swag Digital Network. So not only will you have the ESPN Plus games, the HBCU Go games on um, uh, televised, but you'll all have so, also have games televised on Swag Digital Network. Start off with you, Kelvin. Are there any matchups that intrigue you? I mentioned one with Edward Waters. Uh, a lot of people have a lot of buzz with the Edward Waters program and the SIAC in terms of things that they can do today. And they will be visiting Alcorn State Braves down on the reservation. Yeah, they think it'll be a pretty good drive up. I believe we've played them before or maybe uh, played somebody in the vicinity. I think with what we coming into, I don't know if it's our first game. Uh, I didn't see the date on it. The 928 is the Valley game. But mm -hmm. um, I believe the Edward Waters game would give us some good footing, uh, especially after coming off of UAB to start with, Vanderbilt. So um, I think those two games will get us somewhat primed to see what we have, and then we'll lock into like our normalized game plan when, it's, uh, when we lock in with Edward Waters. That looks like uh, that'll be the home opener, Edward Waters at all for September 14th. So it yep. uh, looks like an intriguing matchup there. Andy Drew. Uh, you got a, a good one uh, in the middle of October. October 12th, Southern will visit Texas Southern. That game will be on Sweat Digital Network. Yeah, that, that's going to be a good one. I'm really going to be interested in the Lane-Jackson State game that you mentioned. Ah, yeah. Because we saw Lane, what was it, two years ago, they beat uh, Tennessee State. They knocked out and Tennessee State. And did they, they came close to beating UAPB last year, if I do recall. Exactly. Correctly. Uh, UAPB had two close scares, almost losing to Lane and to Miles last year. But what intrigues me, Charles, and I mm -hmm. have to ask this question. We've seen we've seen the ESPN schedule. We've seen the HBCU Go schedule. We Now we've seen the SWAC digital schedule. What about the rest of the content? Where is that going? Good question, Eddie. Uh where is uh in terms of content? Well, what what games? The content, the games that are not being picked up by these uh by the various entities that we know that are uh, streaming. Are they uh are they going to be streamed by the by the home team or you know pick your well, just good well, good luck on seeing them well, if I you're not if you're not in the stands. It's actually interesting because I if I'm not mistaken, all games are are covered. If you're taking a look at the ESPN schedule. And I and I don't have I don't have everything in front of me, but the ESPN Plus schedule, the HBCU Go schedule, and then the Sweat Digital Network schedule, I I think for the most part every everything is covered. And maybe if it's not covered, I would assume uh, that probably the uh, school was probably at least streaming. But I, I think we're just in a, a a different digital age where you have access to all of these games if you want to watch. Them. Yeah, okay. I, I want to. I want to say that all of the Alcorn games are covered, especially if Valley and Edward Waters are on uh, the network you just mentioned, uh, Swag Digital. Then mm -hmm. we have another, I believe, eight games, six to eight games that are over on the ESPN side. And then the UAPB is televised on the local. And I'll have to see Bandy will be televised probably on the SEC network while he's on the streaming situation. So, we are probably covered. I just don't know who, who's carrying the, um, the Jackson State Alcorn game, but it will. Uh, I believe. I believe all games are covered. I'm, I'm with you, Charles. There may be a few glitches in there in terms for the SWAT games, but mm -hmm. I thought when I looked at all the schedules and kind of laid them out that every all the games were covered. Yeah, and that's a that's a good question, Ad. And I probably have to do some due diligence, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, I, I pulled up the schedules from HBCU Go and the ESPN. Plus, on last week, and I saw that there are a lot of games that were covered on there. And then looking at the Swag Digital schedule today, it, it kind of catches those that weren't on those two platforms. So I, I we're, we're uh, fully immersed, if you will, in this new era of uh, everybody will be televised, whether you're talking about the ESPN platform, HBCU Go, or Swag Digital via YouTube. So uh, you will have access to watching your favorite team on a, on a plethora of, of, of platforms. So a uh, great question. We'll do some new business and make sure that everybody's covered. You will also have a plethora 
of armchair quarterbacks now, since every game is going to be seen, everybody's going to be, you know, I should have ran this or they should have ran that now because you have access to the content. I just had to throw and, that and, in there, man. And Emma Jones makes a very uh, interesting uh, point in the in the in the chat. Uh, he hopes that the Swag Digital will allow for chat to go on uh, during the course of that game. So when you talk about armchair quarterbacks, everybody gets to put on their headsets this upcoming season. <laughs> So let's take a look at it. Uh, great games that are coming up on uh, Swag Digital Network. But uh, and I want to stop and take this time to say, you know, I, I really enjoyed uh, seeing everybody at uh, Swag uh, Media Day. Uh, and just, you know, you know, we don't always get an opportunity to lay eyes on each other, but to lay eyes on uh, all the uh, entities that cover uh, HBCU athletics, HBCU sports, uh, especially during the course of football season. I have to say it was great seeing you guys sharing uh uh, an adult beverage or a cigar. Uh, Enjoy that as well, guys. <laughs> yes, it was. It was a great time seeing everybody there, and uh, also seeing seeing all the multifaceted coverages of the uh, Swack Media Day. I kind of went back and pre and saw some of the recaps today online or on YouTube, and there was some really, really great content. Really enjoyed the new fam you coach. After I got a chance to kind of watch all the, inter the different interviews. Uh, mm -hmm. Brought a different level of energy to the room. Uh, it was really, uh, I just thought it was just really neat to just see the different personalities, with, especially with the new coaches and then the second year coaches coming back. And then with the guys that have been there for a while, I think it was just a really, really all in all great event put on uh, there in Birmingham and, and a great place to be. Yeah, uh, great coverage by Black College Sports Network as well. Uh, as They had a, a tremendous presence there. Uh, uh, at Swag Media Day, I uh, didn't get a chance to participate and hear uh, some of the predictions, so I'm I'm more than willing to get into some of it today. I tell you what, we're going to take a quick, quick break, and we'll come right back here on Inside the HBC Sports Lab. We got a lot to get to, folks. Since 2002, Empowerment Resources, Inc., a nonprofit organization, has empowered more than 1,500 youth and adults in Duval and surrounding counties. Through its programs, Journey into Womanhood, Girls Mentoring, Life Skills for Teens, and Parenting Education Coaching. To get involved with programs, volunteer, or donate, visit www.empowermentresourcesinc.org. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash empowerment.resources and instagram.com forward slash empowerment J-A-X. The human voice has always connected audiences with experiences. Major brands all across America have trusted Kevers Voice time and time again. Conversational, powerhouse, intelligent, and sincere. That's the voice you need for your creative marketing process. K-E-A-V-E-R-S-V-O-I-C-E dot -E com. Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice dot com. Always on, all the time. Nope. Nope. Come on, him? Ooh, I like him. Quick, the quicker picker-upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eight. He's a nine. Bounty, the quicker picker-upper. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website, www.slowburnwaco.com. That's www.slowburnwaco.com. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah, and who the ball, So listen to Professor, uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. And pay attention, Boy, cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. Come back in to the Sports Lab. Kelvin Carter and A.D. Drew here with myself, Charles Bishop. A uh, lot of football uh, talk to get to. Uh, let's start. CIAA uh, Media Day was. Uh, we, Yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, uh, predicted order of finish, and I'll go through that. 
uh, with you real quick, but what we take a look at is I'm trying to pull it up here with this slow computer I got, but we'll take a look at the CIAA predicted order of finish. Uh, so coming in at 11, Bluefield State, Elizabeth City State at 10, Livingstone at 9, Lincoln, Pennsylvania coming in at 8, Shaw uh, predicted to finish 7th, Winston-Salem State, ooh, uh, predicted to finish six. Bowie State. Oh, fall from glory for Bowie State. They are predicted to finish fifth. Johnson C. Smith predicted to finish fourth. Fayetteville State. A little bit of a surprise. It's a CIAA South representative in the championship game last year. Predicted to finish third. Virginia Union uh, predicted to finish second. Uh, Virginia State predicted to finish number one. Jada Byers coming back for the Virginia Union. Hey, he Drew, any surprises with the uh, rankings with regards to the CIAA? Yeah, I was actually surprised. I was not surprised that the two Virginia schools are one, two, but I was surprised at the order of the two Virginia schools in that one, two. Uh, I, I figured Union with the defending champ being the defending champion with yeah. Jada Byers returning for his uh for his final season would have been number one. And not only with Jada Byers, but just the run game that Virginia Union has because everything Virginia Union has, it travels. Good running game, good defense. That mm. stuff travels. That stuff tends to stay consistent no matter who the players are on your particular team. So that surprised me. Uh, Fayetteville State coming in at three with the no longer a north-south that also kind of surprised me. I thought maybe they would still be in that top one or two. Would you consider Virginia State, Virginia Union, and Bowie all have to play each other? Well, mm. that's a that's a chance that you could wind up with a good team, but still wind up with two losses among amongst those three teams uh, that that we're talking about. So that kind of surprised me. Fairfield State did not sneak up in there in between one of those two Virginia teams. You did mention the uh, non-divisional format that uh, we're starting to see now, uh, not only in the SIAC, but in the CIAA. Uh, any thoughts, uh, uh, and either one of you can jump in in regards to this, in terms of uh, what you have a preference for. Do you prefer the divisional format, North versus South, or do you like to see this non-divisional format, best two teams end up in the championship game? Kevin, I'll start with you. Well, uh, I think last year after watching one of the larger conferences do it, like with the PAC, I believe it was the PAC-12, formerly mm -hmm. the PAC-10, I actually liked it until I got to the end and then saw like a the same matchup from the previous week. Um, but I do think that in, in terms of where we are, and especially with the Celebration Bowl, and I know that kind of loops over, if you have a conference where the teams are off balance, it can produce a championship game for you, even if you didn't have enough for different divisions, meaning you just go with a straight, straight up and down format and the best two teams play at the end. Um, and I would be intrigued to know, take a team like an Alabama state in the swag that plays basically an all swag schedule with the exceptions, I think of Tuskegee and Alabama state. Yeah. And that aligns them. It, it may make for a better overall economic proposition for, for all parties involved because you're keeping because you're gonna guarantee that everyone plays everybody. But when you go into the divisional play, sometimes you leave opponents off that are in your conference but out of division. That's a great point. Uh uh and I, sometimes I I have to remember uh that, that you there's an opportunity that you might not see uh everybody uh when you're playing that that, that sort of format. But uh and I was gonna follow up on that uh A D uh, your thoughts in regards to what you prefer seeing, and 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 I think some of it is probably determined by fans as well. In terms of once you get used to seeing something for a little while, and then uh, there's always talk, chat, scuttlebutt, whatever you want to uh, call it, in terms of seeing it in a different way. But AD, your thoughts? Well, first of all, no one wants to see a four and four or five and three team representing one side of your conference or another against a one loss team the other side of the conference who had the division format. So in that regard should tend to produce a better game. Now in the SIAC, I know Tuskegee and Miles 
benefit from the divisional format because let's be real, the, the, the tougher teams were always on the east side of the SIAC. So you knew whoever won Tuskegee and Miles was going to be in that in that championship game. That's what I'm afraid of with this uh, CIAA uh, format. Yeah, I like that you can get an opportunity to have all the teams, but you're still running a north-south schedule format in the CIAA this year. There's no schedule balance. So <laughs> will, those north te- will those north teams cancel each other out because, mm-hmm. because of that? And, and the south teams have an advantage because they're still running on the southern schedule where you're still playing all your former southern opponents. And I'm always curious about this because – and Dr. Ville makes this point that these things sort of run in cycles. Uh, I remember once upon a time, uh, Swag West, you know, when they have when they would have matchups against uh, teams in the Swag East, Swag West was just a more dominant conference. And then that shift happened, and 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 then we started to see the Swag East teams start knock off Swag West teams uh, a, a, a lot more in succession. But uh, how do you feel? Are, are these things really cyclical? Uh, but it's almost that cycle of dominance that starts the thinking in terms of let's go to this non-divisional format. I think, let me jump that. And I, with the SWAC, the SWAC championship game is 13 to 11 in favor of the West all time. But the East has won the last six in a row and eight of the last 10. So you talk about cyclical jobs. That's the perfect example of it. And you, Kelvin, who's uh, Alcorn's team, who used to be in the East, is now in the West. So, you know, it's it's kind of interesting because those uh, they're the ones who started off that Eastern run with that uh, with that uh, eight of the last ten. We started off with those Alcorn teams who, are, who now represent the West. And what a run those all quarantines had. Uh, <laughs> <Kelvin>. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I want to make sure I mention uh, Tennessee State uh, uh, in the OVC. And we can talk a little bit about Tennessee State. They are predicted to finish fourth. Uh, question with regards to Tennessee State. Uh, is that the best? And I'm probably going to ask Brandon King this at some point. Is that the best we're going to see Tennessee State within that conference in terms of how they view them, how they look at them, how they look at the talent that they bring in. Can they break into the upper echelon, into the OVC? It's been a while now uh, since Tennessee State has had uh, sustained success uh, in the Ohio Valley Conference. Well, if you just take, for instance, there's a local school here called Lindenwood University that just shifted to D1 and they, Division 1A, AA, and they're in the OVC. And just from a pure resource perspective, they have more resources than TSU will ever have devoted to football. Um, they get strong recruits out of this local area. They just got the running back and the quarterback from East St. Louis High School just because they were there. And I think these are students that traditionally may have chosen an HBCU. So if I look at it, I think four might be the best they can get because see, Southeast Missouri State is normally a pretty strong power in there. Murray State usually runs hot. I, yeah. I think I would love to see a situation where, with the MEAC being at what six teams now, um, it, it'd be hard to add them to the MEAC. But I don't, you know, with the way airline conferences now, anything's possible. But mm. when you get finished talking, I think I think you're going to see Hampton and A and T come back to the MEAC, mm. and I think we discussed this a little bit in Swag Media because the conference that they're in is folding as we, you know, as we talk. So if you add it. If you took the six teams and added a and Hampton, and added a TSU, which I believe would be more at home in an HBCU conference, and I don't, uh, you know, their rationale for being an OVC, of course, is probably more basketball related and more revenue driven than anything. Mm-hmm. Hey, hey, Kelvin, Kelvin, I can see a and coming back. I- Hampton is. Hampton is Hampton. Hampton has a different attitude. We'll just say it like that. Uh, now, if you could add an A&T with a Tennessee State, I think that would be a good fit for the 
for the BAC. But getting back to the original question, Charles, you talk about Tennessee State. Unless Tennessee State decides they want to devote the resources into their, into their athletics, into their program, they're not going to be able to uh, compete and be in the upper half of the OVC. Now, we see new president there. They're talking about doing some renovations to Hale Stadium. They've got a couple of other things going uh, going on that they're talking about renovating some facilities. So maybe after they do those type things, students may start to flock back down to Tennessee State. But until then, nah, the, the, the Tennessee State will continue to be mediocre in the OVC. So quick question uh, for the remaining time we have in this segment. Uh, what are some of those resources that you think would help get them um, in that upper tier, that, that, that top three of the OVC? Well, I think when you look at the OVC, and I'm, and I'm going to have to look up their conference to see exactly who's in there, but if, is Eastern Illinois in the OVC? I don't even know anymore. With all these Once teams. upon a time, yeah. yeah that's, that's, I have yeah. To yeah. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> well, the, the challenge around it is you have some schools in there. Like, like I said, a Lindenwood, it's new to it, but they have a lot of funding, you know, devoted to it. And I just believe Tennessee State, I, I honestly believe they would actually be able to recruit better, you know, being with the other HBCUs. That's just my perspective on it because I watched them play here in St. Louis and watched them, on, uh, you know, and they compete. But those schools, and it's not a bad imbalance, but I think just for their overall brand, incitement, gate retail, I think if you – if you, I would love to go see their attendance on their game versus an HBC opponent, HBCU opponent versus an OVC opponent and look at the revenues yeah. derived from there. I'd love to see that. Oh, yeah. Well, we know what that revenue is. And you mentioned recruiting, Kelvin. For a lot of kids in the Midwest who grew up in the Midwest like I did, like our producer Brian did, Tennessee State was kind of that HBCU that you wanted to go to and still be close to home. You know, St. Louis, hmm. you got more St. Louis kids wanting to go to Tennessee State than they do uh, Lincoln, who's right up the road, or Harris Stowe, who's right there in the same town. Same thing with kids in uh, Indianapolis. Same thing with uh, with Cincinnati. So, I, you know, you got, you got to keep the, that in mind. Tennessee State, if they get the other things handled, would be able to recruit those Midwestern students into their – into their university, which could make them competitive. Well, uh, and also, too, that with that being said, Drew, if you live in St. Louis and I've sent a many kid to TSU, they waive the out-of-state fee because they're within 250 miles. So they have mm -hmm. a good recruiting base there. They also – they actually had one of the top um, basketball recruits out of St. Louis that went there, Jordan Nesbitt. He ended up transferring to um, – over to Hampton. So if you look at this conference, you got Charleston Southern, Eastern Illinois, Gardner Webb, Lindenwood, Southeast, Tennessee State, Tennessee Tech, UT Martin, and Western Illinois. Eastern Illinois has produced the likes of Tony Romo, Cooper Cup, um, uh, you know, I, I, I was about to call him something else, uh, Jimmy Garoppolo <laughs> from, from the 49ers. But yeah. if you just think about it, I just think, I don't know, I think their rationale for being there is more around basketball than football. But I, they might come into a conference like the SWAC or the MEAC and actually be able to really, really put their foot on foot on the gas, you know, in a lot of different areas, too. Interesting point. Uh, and a uh, very poignant uh, comment in the chat. Uh, Rod Reed had things going for Tennessee State back in 2000, early uh, 2010 through, I believe, 2013. They were in the FCS playoffs. But it's been a, a long slog back for the Tennessee State Tigers uh, since then, since the Rod Reed days. But uh, those were some uh, good years for Tennessee State back then. And we'll take another quick break. Hey, we'll start. Hey, Charles, oh, go for it, Andy. Can I give Can I give people a trivia question going into break and see if they can answer it? Oh, this should be fun. Go for it. All right. Football. How many head football coaches are doctors? In HBCU football, and see if you can name them while we're while we're in the break. That's a good question. <laughs> Let's take a quick break here on inside the HBCU Sports Lab. We'll try to answer AD Drew's uh, trivia question, and we'll get into a little bit of swag talk. 
itchy, squirmy, scratchy, family not getting clean? Get Charmin Ultra Strong. Go get them! It just cleans better. With a diamond weave texture, your family can use less while still getting clean. Goodbye, itchy squirm. Hello, clean bottom. <laughs> <laughs> we all go. Why not enjoy the go with Charmin? At Hampton Law, our primary goal is to provide non-traditional yet effective solutions and redefine the approach to client legal concerns. As your trusted legal advisor, we believe in sophisticated, personalized services that eliminate the confusion and complexity sometimes associated with legal matters. Our high standard for client care and concern, coupled with our extensive legal knowledge and skills, make Hampton Law a resource focused on the protection of the client's interest and overall goals. We value our clients and truly enjoy working with them. Visit thamptonlaw.com to conveniently schedule an appointment online. Tamika Hampton Esquire. 1631 Rock Springs Road, Suite 336, Apopka, Florida, 407-494-1471, thamptonlaw.com. Nope. Nope. Come on, him. Ooh, I like him. <laughs> The Quicker Picker Upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eight. He's a nine. Bounty, the Quicker Picker Upper. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge, featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website www.slowburnwaco.com That's www.slowburnwaco.com When it comes to professional learning, teachers deserve better. From the leader in online learning, Stride brings you the Stride Professional Development Center, an on-demand library of mobile-friendly courses that gives teachers choice and flexibility, allowing them to learn anytime and anywhere. Our dynamic courses provide bite-sized learning and help educators advance their knowledge while also gaining professional development hours. It's time you take charge of your learning. Visit us today to get started. Compress the analytic data with your hip-hop. If you know them like I know them, they're going to tell you if your team, if they want to love yeah, and root about, root about. So listen to Professor Yes Sir and pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. Welcome back to Inside HBCU Sports Lab with Kelvin Carter, A.D. Drew, and myself. Uh, A.D., you gave us a trivia question going into break in terms of coaches with a doctorate. Man, you, I think everybody had enough time to go to uh, chat GPT and get some answers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I would tell you, for me, off the top of my head, the two who jump out, of course, is Dr. Alvin Parker, Virginia Union, and uh, Don Hill Ely, uh, and uh, Doctor, he's now Doctor uh, Don Hill Ely from uh, used to be at Alabama State. But what do you have? Oh, uh, that's a good one. What you got? Any guesses, Kelvin? You said just you said football. Yeah, just football only. There's probably hey, only you. two because I know I'm almost for certain if there's one, there's only one in the set in the swag. That being, if I just had to put a guess on it, 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 it shamefully I would say it's Maynard. <laughs> <laughs> well, although Maynard may have one, only two coaches actually use their initials, their EDS or whatever uh, type of uh, terminal degree they have. Both of them are in the CIAA. Henry Frank, Dr. Henry Fraser the third, and Dr. Yeah. Alvin Parker. Yeah, right. That's what uh, Diego said in the chat. Yeah, I yeah. knew in the swag it wasn't. If you just uh, sometimes now I'll say this, Ad, and you put that. We're both. I work in academics um, and high school, college, and the one thing about it is, if you kind of look at the trajectory of some of the coaches, and also now if you look at the ages of some of the coaches, 
if they've never told too much at the high school level where your pay is normally um, boosted by your level of degree from master to specialist to doctorate, then if they were on that GA track, most of them probably stops at that master's of sports administration or kinesiology or something of that nature. It's just a, it's just the nature of the beast because it, yeah. in, in my, you know, in my opinion, it's simpler as, as me as a high school coach to get my doctorate than it would be as a full-time, you know, have to manage that full roster and all those things that go on in the college level to, to attain that degree. Yeah. And I will say this, there may be other head coaches out there who have degrees, but you know, uh, some people don't put their initials with their names, uh, just because they just don't want they just don't want it out there. Well, that, well there are people who have EDSs who just are just regular Mister or Ms. So and so and so and so. No, that's true. I mean, like the Jackson State soccer coach has his doctorate. So <laughs> you know, you got different strokes for different folks. I I think you find it, especially in an academia piece, you find it that the challenges around you know, first of all, graduating as a player and then shifting into the coach. So. That's a that's that that is an interesting piece as we as we stress academics and educational attainment uh, amongst our um, amongst our players. We, well, AD, I'll, I'll pose this to uh, Charles, and you can kind of chime in on this. I was talking with a group of young men at the at the Swag Media Day, and we also talk. We always talk about this underrepresentation of of black men and black women in the sports arena. AD, you just kind of touched on in my research, what tends to be the reason why our kids go and play the sports and then they go and either pursue that dream of the sport or pursue something. And in order to participate and or coach this at the college level, there's certain things that has to happen. For instance, Deion Sanders went and graduated from Talladega. He went and graduated from Talladega for a reason because he couldn't take the job at Jackson state without a degree. Mm. And so now, when I was talking to the young men, the, the players, I said, I told them, I said, whether you want to believe it or not, get yourself a degree, hit the GA track. We all want to believe that we're going to turn pro or we're going to have our name called on Sunday. But at the end of the day, we hadn't heard it. Um, there's a lot of things to it. But your education is paramount as it's paid for. So those are some of the things that we want to see more of us on the sidelines in these positions we ultimately must get more of us educated to the point to where we get able to accept it. I was about to say, I was about to jump in real quick. I mean, uh, in regard to the career track uh, of a coach, I mean, you they typically have more education because they start out, you know, in uh, as a GA uh, in terms of working on a master's of some sort. Uh, but I, I find that very interesting, especially when you take a look at uh, the coaching profession. Uh, when you take a look at the sport of football, you tend to have – uh, coaches who have that, that secondary degree. Right. But now I will say this. If you look at now the state of coaching across the country, especially in high school, you'll find a big crop of coaches, both football and basketball in high school, yeah. that because of the parameters may or may not have their degree. You can be a long-term high school football coach without having a degree because you just have to meet the substitute requirements. Whereas in order to coach in college, you have to you have to attain that that bachelor's, and then while you're in the GA position, you're working on that master's. So it's also according to where that starting line is. So we miss out on a lot of highly qualified, talented candidates because they've not finished that degree level of attainment to, that allows them to actually apply for the job. Yeah. And I, I just want to say this: even if they do make it to Sunday, hey. They go. They're gonna retire around thirty anyway. So you're still gonna need that degree to be able to make a living for the rest of your life because you still have forty to fifty good years after your playing career. No doubt about it. Very interesting conversation. I that was. Uh, I'm glad we kind of turned things in that direction. I always have a little uh, academia uh, within the sports lab. So <laughs> good job, guys. Let's turn our attention. See the Southwestern Athletic Conference Swag Media Day. Uh, full disclosure, I did not get to hear all the prognostications and the pundits and this, that, and the other with regards to Swag Media Day. Um, I was doing some work there with Swag Digital, so I was uh, interviewing players and listening to the coaches. Uh, and I tell you, one of the things that for me always comes out of Swag Media Day, the optimism for every school. Uh, and this year, 
parody all over the place. I'll start with this question here uh, to, to both of you, AD. I'll start with you. What jumped out to you as the surprise of the 2024 Slack media? Actually, one of the surprises to me was the fact that Alcorn was picked number one in the mm. West. And it's no disrespect to Alcorn, but when you consider four of the six teams in the West have new head coaches this year, and mm. you pick one, and the your peers pick one of the teams that has a new head coach, although he did come from within, he is the only coach that was promoted from within the program of those four. To well, no, let me let me take that back because Southern's coach was promoted from within the program also. Terrence Graves, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, but you picked a a team who has who's a new head coach to be the predicted number one. That that surprised me. Uh, the fact on uh, flipping it over to the other side, FAMU, Alabama State, Jackson State, that really did not surprise me as much. You know, the question is by putting Alabama State number one. Alabama State did not finish games last year. That that was their biggest thing. They did not finish games last year. So you 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 saying that Alabama State is going to be able to finish this year when they haven't finished for the last two years. FAMU, I understand the doubt with FAMU, especially coming off the backs of what happened to Jackson State, where Jackson State had the big defections after winning the championship two years ago. So I, I kind of understood that. I honestly thought Jackson State was going to jump uh, FAMU in the, in the ranking. So the fact that Jackson State still came in behind FAMU, that actually kind of surprised me. Hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, surprised me as well. Uh, you, you can't see the look on my face when you started talking FAMU in terms of uh, some of the same verbiage that I heard with regards to Jackson State the prior 2023. Life hits you fast, comes full circle, because sort of the same thing with regards to, 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 to FAMU in 2024. Kevin, your your thoughts in terms of any surprises? Um, I, I was not as surprised about the Bama State piece. I saw them up close, I believe, three times last year. Um, one thing that I do know about the teams that's, it's a good thing. I heard T.C. Taylor talk about it. I heard Coach Sid talk about it. And I didn't hear of any of the other coaches. But one thing about Alcorn and Alabama State, they built a pretty strong foundation around some, some high schoolers that this is going to be their junior year. And they had these high schoolers that actually led her. Like Alcorn had eight, eight high school guys that came in that ended up lettering for them. And I think what – and, and, you know, I know all the coaches don't know all the information, but I think when you start talking about teams that are, you know, not necessarily built off the portal, but I think as, as we saw last year, what I saw with Bama State was if, if Body is who he is and he comes back and he's true to form, uh, I do believe that they, they put them in the driver's seat, although I believe Jackson State is going to win that division. And I and I really, to be honest with you, I don't think it's going to be close. And on uh-huh. our – and on the Alcorn side, I think it's going to be tight. I think we'll squeeze the division out, um, especially based upon our quarterback play with Macon. But I think Jackson State definitely has a clear – it has a clear advantage, in my opinion, based upon the way T.C. has retooled that roster and also fortified it with some kids that are locally bred, local talent that's there. So that's the way I kind of feel about that. Like, I wasn't surprised about the Alcorn pick knowing how they lost some of those games. You know, like an all-night hangout and lose to Texas Southern and then a totally unprepared on the PV. I think there will be a laser focus with that group with so many of them coming back. Yes, we lose Javion Howard to the Green Bay Packers, but however, we get the quarterback back for the transfer that's healthy this year, new offensive coordinator, and, um, and seemingly things are tied up. But I just – I tell you what, I just really – I think I think Jackson State really, really has a, a strong team. Can I, Let can me I add, jump in and ask a question? Uh, go for it, Eddie. A quick question. Does, mm-hmm. does anybody go undefeated this year? Because the last no. three years, no. the champion no. went undefeated. 
No, no. Too much parity in the league. Too much parity in the league. I, this year. I, I agree also. Yeah. Uh, I do want to ask this question, Kelvin. Uh, we didn't really get an opportunity to see uh, Tyler Macon last year. Uh, had a huge run uh, against USM, but make a case uh, for Alcorn uh, thriving under his leadership, uh, especially uh, when we talk about this being a quarterback league. Half hey, quarterback will 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 win some games. Uh, everybody talks about that, but what struck me was only two quarterbacks came to the Swag Media Day. Uh, so make a case for uh, Alcorn work in, in in that regard. Well, I think with Macon, and this is what I know because I've seen him since high school, seen him compete at Mizzou, and I kn- I knew at Mizzou if they didn't want him to be play, he shouldn't be playing because they had a guy who was about five inches taller than him that was like that type of prototype quarterback that they that, that they wanted to roll with. I think he goes to Alcorn and, and finds a situation that's perfect and matches his high school career, which was phenomenal. I wouldn't have brought him either because I wanted to, I want I want this to be like a sleeper effect because nobody in the swag saw it. You know, after the high ankle sprain, the you know diagnosis was a little off. So no, they won't go undefeated. But if he if he show if he does what he can do, which is spin the football, and, and if the accuracy is there, uh, we got a receiving core. That's, uh, I mean, Auckland has a receiving core that's phenomenal, and the running game. I think what Coach said, but. One thing it is, it'll be we did we we fence, which means we all play defense from special teams mm. to the to the defensive side of the ball. But I think we're gonna get an adequate balance, which will get us back to on brand football for Alcorn, which probably produced three all swag quarterbacks, maybe four, after in that window of when we were running off the championships from Eric Canna to the Felix Harper to those guys. I think that's what we're back to because he has a set of wheels. But he also has a new offensive coordinator that's really zoned in and, and simplified the, the platform for him. Uh, you make an interesting point. On but Kel, but football. During that time, Go ahead, AD. I was going to say, but Kelvin, during that time, didn't all those quarterbacks you named come into the season as the number two? Yes. And they all got the position based on injury. Uh, we even saw that last year with Eric Allen. Uh, right. Uh, with uh, Eric Allen. Was, yeah. Uh, question, and, and, and you mentioned on-brand football for Alcorn. What is on-brand football for Alcorn? Uh, on-brand for them is a ste- like a steady dose of the RPO, and it has it can't be – I heard one of the coaches tell me, he said the worst thing that happened last year was uh, Howard Rush had a 400-yard rushing game, and it made you feel like this is what we were going to do. And then all of a sudden, you know, they crowded the box. And then by the time they figured it out down the stretch, Allen was having some, some phenomenal passing. You saw it against Jackson State. And I looked at that against Jackson State and said to myself, that probably should have been the formula. Like we should have played more to his strength. And I think making gets us more back towards that Felix Harper type mode, you know, in terms of how he's able, Felix could throw it, but Felix could also go back there and say, you know what, it's just time to get out of there. And I see uh, Mr. CEO Job says they won't be PV, GSU, or SU in the West. And um, we'll go two out of three on those. Let me ask this question, uh, especially in regards to Alabama State. Um, we know they play defense. I believe if you look at the uh, uh, first team and second team uh uh, preseason also all, all conference selections. Uh, they have up to four, maybe five players on there. I'm not looking at it right now, uh, but uh, presence on the defensive side of the ball is Andrew Body the missing piece of the puzzle. Uh, a lot of pundits will say we've only seen him basically for nine games uh, in the SWAC uh, due to health concerns. But uh, is he actually the missing piece of the puzzle? Because you know, if you're an Alabama State fan, you would have thought that uh, Demetrius Davis was that missing piece of the puzzle. But offensively, they have not been able to get over the hump. They lose a big piece in Keyshawn Johnson. Is Andrew Body uh, the piece that's missing? Maybe we'll start with you. I don't know if he's the piece. He's a piece because it's going to take more than Andrew Body uh, to lead that offense for them to do something. You know that. 
let's be real. Andrew Body is not, you know, he's not a 6'5", 230-pound quarterback. So part of that is going to be how you use Andrew Body. Look, we know Alabama State can play defense. There is no doubt about that. Alabama State could play defense before Eddie Robinson got there. Uh, under Eddie Robinson, the defense has improved. But let's let's remember everybody. We saw Alabama State lose to Miles last year. Not only did they lose to Miles, Miles walked them down to beat them last year. So how do we fix that? The the, the other key piece outside the quarterback, Alabama State got to get their, those special teams right. We've seen Alabama State lose games on the last play of the game due to poor special team. So it's just not going to take a quarterback. Unless that quarterback's going to hold the ball, snap the ball, kick the ball, punt the ball, and do a whole bunch of other things to go along with it to fix some of the the deficiencies that Alabama State has had the past couple of years. Well, But I also think what you saw with Alabama State was this, and I think their coach made light of it. The fact that they weren't sustaining drives, the offense virtually ended up putting Alabama State's defense in a position to break after they ain't held all this time. It's on, you know how the swag is. It's up and down. It's up and down. It's a run and shoot. It, 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 it's a never resting game. So if you think about it from, from the, that perspective, body should give them the stability on offense. The defense is, is, is strong as, is, is strong as any other defense in the swag. It, you know, it's a great defense, but it's only so long they can stay out there, you know, before, before something, something's going to happen. Let me uh, ask this question, quick pivot. Two of the more intriguing th- teams uh, I thought coming into Swag Media Day, Southern Jaguars, Terrence Graves taking over the helm there, Mickey Joseph taking over Ed Gramlin. Uh, reason for optimism, I think, at both schools. If they can, uh, uh, Miles Crawley name a Swag Offensive Preseason, Swag Offensive Player of the Year. What's it going to take for the Gramlin Tigers to get back in the mix because so many times with regards to Grambling and Southern, you know, things just aren't settled until the Bayou Classic. Uh, but the question becomes these these two teams, especially in the SWAC West, become very intriguing in terms of Alcorn being predicted f- to finish first. But you hear a lot of rumbling, especially coming from the Baton Rouge area, that this is it's time for Southern to get back in the mix. They were in the SWAC championship uh, uh, game a couple seasons ago uh, and Coach Dooley's first year, but uh, they're starving uh, to get back into the mix in terms of being the Southern brand that we used to see on a consistent basis. Same thing for Grandma. And I always say Grandma, they don't stay down very long. What are the keys uh, for both Southern and Grandma to get back into the mix, especially when we talk about Swag West, it's wide open over there on that side of the ball. Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, Grambling, I believe, if if I had to say who's going to give you the most trouble and somebody just put Jay, uh, Jackson State and Grambling in the SWAC championship game, if I were picking another team, I would strongly believe, based upon what I saw last year out of, uh, out of Grambling, they had all the tools and all the pieces. I don't know how much they lost to graduation or how much they lost to the portal, but if I say that there's a team out there that's being underestimated – uh, I could literally see Grant Gramlin being the team to return to some type of, you know, yesteryear glory and, and run off with it all, you know, because they were they were impressive. It's just that you can see some of the, you know, the miscues and some of the um, imploding per se. But I, I tell you, they they were impressive as I watched them. I, I couldn't believe we beat them. I was watching it. I was like, now, this is an interesting game because they look from the things that they were doing and the consistency on offense, the play calling, they just look like a well-oiled machine. And I believe with the coach they have now, uh, mm. this is no knock on who, uh, Coach Hugh Jackson. I think he's a fit, and he's going to drive this car to the hill. Uh, Grandma did knock off eventual SWAC uh, West Champion Prairie View last year in the uh, in the in the classic there. Uh, A.D. Drew, uh, Southern fans believe they got the right guy in Terrence Graves. Make a case for the Jaguars. I believe they do have the right guy. Uh, the, the question is, can 
offensively, can Southern find an identity and stay with it? Because that the last couple of years, especially under Dooley, <clears throat> excuse me, you haven't seen you saw Southern trying to do what their talent did not allow them to do. Will Terrence Graves actually coach to his talent, or has he recruited? enough talent to fit the system that he wants to run. That is the question with Southern. Southern has Southern has a good program. Southern has talent in the room. The question is, will it be used properly this year? I believe it's been since 2014 uh, since uh, Southern has won a SWAC championship. So uh, knocked on the door a couple of times, but I haven't been able to get in. And it brings me to the Purdue and and Panthers. Surprisingly, not picked to finish first uh, in the SWAC West. They have been one of the more consistent teams in terms of wins in the SWAC, uh, but they haven't been able to knock the door down. What is the key for Prairie View coming into this season? I think I think quarterback play is going to be the key for Prairie View. Uh, can they kind of kind of like uh, Alabama State? Can they sustain drives? Can they keep that defense off of the field? You know, normally, yeah, you want you want to keep the defense off the field. Let them get their rest. Defense's job is to go and try to get three and outs for, for the offense to get the offense ball back. Can Prairie View do that on a consistent basis? Kevin, yeah. yeah, and I I say the same thing about them. I think that they they just have to be consistent because. They'll look like dynamite one day and look like a black cat firecracker the next. It's just like <laughs> it's it's. I mean, they look really really good, and then they'll turn and um, you know play play into their opponent's hands. So I think I think they have plenty of film to look at, plenty of things to look at to show how they can gain a level of consistency that will produce the wins week in week out. And I might say they probably won't look all the same if they, if it makes sense. Like they'll win some games with some runaway scores. But then on the flip side, they're going to come down on the flip side. They're going to win a separate fix. Say say that again, AD. Um, Someone put in the chat, uh, don't forget that um, Alcorn's coach won a championship as a DC with them, I believe. But yeah, that that piece is, uh, they'll they'll have to come up with some consistent play, you know, week in, week out. It's proven they can beat anybody on any given. You know, on every you know, on any given Saturday. Lennon Blow out there throwing shots. He's saying Southern is just a band school now. I can't believe you said that, Lennon. Uh, <laughs> we take a look at man, this boy, my how time flies already at the top of the hour. Uh A D, final thoughts in regards to uh uh what you saw, what you remembered, are your thoughts with regards to SWAC Media Day? And we can go around the room in that regards. It's not just SWAC, CIAA. OVC, we got the Miag next week. Go for it. Floor is yours. Uh oh. Y'all mute there, AD. Number one, haven't heard about that school on the beach. I think I've got to play a spoiler for some schools in the East. They did not take kindly to being a homecoming opponent. They they made sure that they brought that out on on the broadcast. Go for it. Yeah, and, and speaking of uh, schools on the beach, uh, shout out to friend of the program, uh, Jonathan Hernandez, baseball coach at Bethune. Uh, today is his birthday, so uh, happy birthday, Coach oh, Hernandez! Uh, happy birthday, just, Coach! Had to throw that in. It popped up on my Facebook uh, timeline. Nice. Uh, shifting over to the. CIAA. I, I tried to watch Media Day for the CIAA. Uh, had some audio issues uh, being able to listen to the stage presentation for the uh, CIAA. But I still haven't heard the answer to the question of Fayetteville State and Livingstone or one conference game short due to St. All dropping out of the conference. Still have not heard what's going to be the solution with that, especially if you're considering Fayetteville State is going to be one of your top three or four teams in the conference. Uh, that's number two. Looking forward to the BAC, will Howard be the preseason number one 
or will it be central? And if it is central, then everybody down in Miami is jumping for joy because you've got preseason number one in the east of the SWAC, Alabama State, versus BAC preseason number one, North Carolina Central, in the Orange Blossom Classic. Just thought I'd throw it you got a Davis Richard hangover. Can I ask that, that better if you're OBC? <laughs> <laughs> Davis Richard hangover in, in North Carolina Central this upcoming season. Kelvin, your thoughts in regards to what we've seen thus far from these HBCU media days? Um, I think they've done a good job. I kind of looked at um, what I would like to see based on, you know, Swag Media Days was maybe more of a scheduled output. I think we talked about this. If uh, maybe the conference, you know, kicks in a little revenue, and let's all the schools stay the night, you know, both nights. Therefore, all the media, all the, all the, the, you won't have a team saying, hey, we're about to get on the road going back to Gainesville or going back here or going back here to Tallahassee. I just thought that, you know, it would have been much better if guys could have relaxed, had a little lunch, and, and, and actually went around to all of the platforms because all of the platforms do such an amazing job throughout the season of covering and highlighting. Uh, the wonderful world of HBCU sports. So that was the one thing that I was like, you know what? Because people were packing up, and I was like, man, the SEC is on a two day deal, you know. And um, and and I would have just loved for it to be one four of day, scenarios. four day, yeah. And I would just love mm-hmm. for it to be a scenario, four where, day. yeah. Pay pay for the kids' rooms, coaches' rooms, and um, let them be there, you know. And and, and you know, and I know you can't split it into an East and West day because it's not enough teams, but. That's what I felt. But overall, the energy was fantastic. And it's always good to see a new coach. The Florida A&M coach was flat out flat fabulous. I mean, yes, energy uh, embodied embodied what college football is all about, embodied everything that I saw. I really loved, you know, uh, his energy. You know, he, he came to give the people what they want. <laughs> no doubt about it. Uh, uh, I- uh, speaking of, we need, we need to shout out. Jackson State and Florida A&M for being the last two and being the two schools that made sure that they talked to everybody at SWAC Media Day. So shout out to uh, Travis Jerome for making sure Travis that Jerome. everybody yeah. uh, got, and, uh, and Joshua Padilla from Florida A&M for Joshua making Padilla sure well. that their coaches and their players touched every outlet there, include you know, ex- even the ones that, that were not scheduled to be there. And there were some schools, I'm not calling any names, but they did their five scheduled appearances, ate lunch, and dipped. <laughs> I will piggyback on what you were saying, A.D., in regards to the sports information records. Tremendous job. Uh, and I want to say it was a delight talking to uh, the players, uh, representing their schools extremely well. Uh, you know, once upon a time, uh Players didn't particularly want the microphone in, in their face, but in the advent of, of social social media age, uh, these guys were tremendous, very glib, uh, represented their institutions extremely well. So uh, those selections uh, in terms of the, the players that came to SWAC Media Day, uh, tremendous. Uh, very appreciative uh, of those guys who came in and talking. You guys look great in, in your suits and, uh, uh, um, you know, color coordinated things of that nature, but able to talk the game and really enjoyed a lot of that. And and I will say this, I'm going to champion something that I know Dr. Gill has talked about uh, from, from year to year with regards to media days. I want the schools to pack your band directors. Uh, the coaches, they play close to the vest at times, but band directors, ah, I think we get a little bit more, a uh, little, little, little juice out of the band directors in regards to uh, the upcoming season, especially. People want to know. What is the human jukebox? What are they bringing to the forefront in 2024? Same thing. Sonic Boom in the South, March 100. Pack your band directors. It adds a little something to the media days because you are part of the entire zeitgeist of the football season. So, with those parting words. Hey, 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 hey Charles. Yeah, hey, hey, hey Charles. Yeah. Do, do, you, do you bring your top drum majors along with them just like you would bring your players if you brought the band directors? Let the drum majors make an interest with the players. How about that? How about that? You got your social media team, man. Wouldn't that be a great look? You know, your drum majors leading your team. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, hey, I'm with you 100 percent on it. I've always I've said this since I've joined you guys and become a part of the group that 
we have a entire package, and that and that piece plays a big deal in it. It can make a horrible Saturday into an amazing Saturday. The fifth quarter is an incredible piece. You know, if nothing else, they could bring the band directors in for the second half of Tuesday, you know, and fill that content up in the second half of the day. It's a lot of things you could do there, especially in promoting. He wants to, uh, they want to promote the, the band, the national band championships. Well, get the band directors there. It's a thought. It's a thought. Now, <laughs> and, you know, and you just never know. I mean, there's always things, you know, it's what we do within this uh, HBCU sporting environment. Think outside the box. You never know what might happen. Appreciate you guys coming in today. Great, great work uh, in terms of talking about these uh, various media days. We got the MIAC uh, Media Day next week. We'll talk a little bit about that on next Tuesday. As always, you know how we get out of here. Uh, I'll start things off. Of course, AD. Lecture. <laughs> oh. Go for it, Kelvin. I got you, Kelvin. Yes. Dismissed. <laughs> Dismissed. <laughs> Let's get out of here. <laughs> All right. Travel light, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>